Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, very nice introduction. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> I think it was my thing. But uh, so, and I also saw that there are a lot of people, many of which I know, and I'm very happy. I think I should apologize with some of them, which might have already seen the talk, but I didn't have time to prepare a new one. Uh, but anyhow, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, the, the topic is about the pre boundary problem. And more specifically, this um, Bernoulli preboundary problem, which I would soon introduce. So, just let me just start mentioning that uh, everything I'm going to talk about is the joint work with uh, Lucas Polaur and Coach Verbellisto. And uh, okay, so let's start with the problem. So, the Bernoulli preboundary problem is the following. So, you are given three constants lambda zero, lambda plus, and lambda minus, all non negative. And for each subdomain of some space Rd, so this would be the dimension, um, you consider this functional, which is given by the Dirichlet energy of your function u, and then you uh, penalize somehow in different ways the measure where u is positive, negative, or zero. Okay? So you see, uh, and then this penalization is accordingly to these three functions, and then you minimize, you want to minimize the functional among all functions with some given boundary data. Okay, so you see this is, looks like a pretty natural function, and that's, so, and this is what is usually called the Bernoulli two-phase problem. So I'll give you later on a bit of a history of the problem, but let's just start with a remark, which is important, and I think it's causes a bit of confusion in, in literature, which is the fact that, in a sense, this is like a three-phase problem, because you see that you see all the three phases of, of the function, so positive, negative, and zero phase. On the other hand, if D is, say, with um, finite measure, you know that the sum of these three terms, so of the measure where you is positive, negative, and zero, should be the measure of D. So, in a sense, you could you can always absorb one in the other two. So this is not the way you might have seen written this problem, but I like in this way because there is much more symmetry in the three phases. And actually, yeah, that's what I would argue later on, that this is indeed a, a three-phase problem somehow. Okay? Okay, so that's, that's the problem. And once you start with the variational problem, you're interested in some basic things. So the first one is the existence of minimizers, which they do exist in this. It's direct methods in calculus of variation, for standard. In general, you don't have uniqueness. The problem is pretty much non-convex because of uh, these terms here. And what would be the behavior of a minimizer? You see from here that the minimizer would like somehow to be harmonic as much as it can to make this term happy. On the other hand, this penalization terms might unbalance the fact that the function is harmonic. Right? So imagine the simplest situation in which you just penalize, say you, you look just, uh, and I will come to this, but I just look to among positive functions, that's for instance if the boundary data is positive, and I don't look, I don't penalize negative and zero measure. Well, then you see that an harmonic function would like, with a positive boundary data, would like to be strictly positive inside the domain, but this might be non convenient for the terms. So there is a balance, so there is a competition between the terms, and that's what makes the problem easy. Okay? And uh, that, that type of problem I was mentioning is, uh, would be important in our analysis, and this is called the so-called one-phase preboundary problem, in which you just penalize, so you set two of the constants to zero, and you just penalize the measure of the positive uh, part of the, um, of the function, and, but you restrict yourself to functions which are not negative that, for instance, a consequence, uh, this would be clear if you, if you start with a boundary data which is positive, but anyhow, so what is usually called the one-phase Bernoulli problem is to try to minimize this functional among all non-negative functions, okay? So this might come from the boundary data or for something else, but that, that's what uh, the one, so-called one-phase Bernoulli problem is, okay? And here again, you, uh, that's what I was mentioning, that you see 
more clearly somehow the competition between trying to be harmonic and then always positive and try to not be too much positive. Okay, and that's this competition is what gives you some interesting phenomena. Okay, so this problem actually the, the one phase was introduced by Alta and Caffarelli and the two phase by Alta Caffarelli and Friedman in the 80s. And the motivation was somehow, and that's why the name Bernoulli appeared, was somehow some problem in, um, in uh, fluid mechanics. So in studying flows with jets and cavity. And then, okay, you don't really have the Dirichlet energy of some lower order term somehow, because basically the, the problem, I mean, studying this type of flow with jets and cavities in certain uh, symmetric regimes. So you actually look to some dimension reduction of the problem. So you don't have a Dirichlet energy, you have some part of the Dirichlet energy you want to write, like say, cylindrical coordinates or whatever. And uh, anyhow, besides this, which is the original motivation, this, is, this problem has become sort of a model problem for a lot of free boundary type problems. In the sense, in free boundary, what I would argue is that there are two extreme model problems. One is the so-called obstacle problem, which again was studied by Caffarelli in the, in the 70s. And the other ones are this free boundary, this Bernoulli type problem. And somehow you have a sort of interpolation between these two problems in between. You can actually write down a proper interpolation between these two problems, but these are the two extrema. And they have slightly different behavior, though some techniques are in common. So they are really, nowadays, they're really model problems for, for free boundary. And actually, what is the reason why I ended up studying this problem is that they are related. So the Bernoulli problems are related to what are called shape optimization problems. So <clears throat> let me maybe just to introduce and also to explain what was my path to this type of problem. Let me present a few um, shape optimization problem and how they relate to this Bernoulli free boundary problem. So the first shape optimization problem I would like to, to, to mention is the optimal capacitary problem in which you have a domain B and then you take a subset U of D, of this domain, and you look to the capacity of U relative to D, which is nothing but the minimization. So the, the, the optimal way somehow to so the energy of the optimal function, uh, optimal in the sense that it's the cheapest transi transition, transition between one and zero. So you want to be one uh, here on U and zero on the boundary. On the boundary, and you want to make this transition in an harmonic way, so minimizing this energy. Okay, so that's the capacity of U relative to D, which you can physically interpret as the, capac the capacity of the capacity of U. Actually, you want to set the potential to be one and zero. Okay, but that's you see, it's a proper somehow a property of your domain U, depending on its shape and its location inside D. And you would like to minimize the capacity, say, among all subsets. So this is a trivial problem because the empty set is zero capacity. So you want either to fix your measure, say you want to build a capacitor with some fixed measure, or you want to somehow penalize um, having two small measures. So this would be somehow the, the Lagrange multiplier version of fixing the measure, since I'm lazy and writing directly this problem. And this is a non-trivial problem. So it might be that the measure should be positive to make this term happy with respect to this one. Okay. So that's pretty much a natural problem and it arises in several ways, in several situations. And so what's the link with the Bernoulli free boundary problem? Well, this is a minimum problem. And this is a minimum problem as well. So you have a double mean problem. Okay. And the double mean problems can be written as a unique minimum problem among functions. So the problem is indeed equivalent in minimizing the Dirichlet energy of a function minus the measure where the function is one, okay? or library code one, the two. They are equivalent to this. That's the function above one. Um, so you look to this minimization problem and the optimal uh, minimizer for this problem would be, uh, I mean, the, it's one set would be a solution for the capacity. The, the optimal capacity problem. 
But now, uh, you see again the measure of D is fixed, so, and this minimum, uh, optimal function doesn't have any reason to take any values different from zero, uh, so I mean, outside the zero one. So that's the same thing that minimizing the Dirichlet energy plus the measure where V is in between and one, the zero and one. Okay, up to this constant. But now, if you call u one minus v, well, then u is just solving uh, a Bernoulli preboundary problem. So, if you want to understand what are the properties of the optimal capacitor, you need to understand what are the property of the zero set in this case of the solution of the one phase Bernoulli preboundary. Okay. And actually, you see that since you started with the geometric problem somehow, I mean, in the sense that you are really interested in the shape, when you want to study properties of this minimizer, you want to, to look at the properties which are on, of the zero set, not just of the function. I mean, obviously, you are going to use the function to, to reduce this property, but you actually really interested in the geometric object, which would be in the, the pre boundary, which is the boundary where, uh, where the function is zero, and that's where you, um, which is not recursive, <coughs> which is not recursive by the um, by the problem, so that's why it's a boundary. Okay, so that's for the one phase problem. So there is another problem which leads quite easily to the two phase problem. So, and this is an optimal partition problem. Well, it's not. I mean, partition is a bit an uh, um, with a wrong term, but uh, the model is an um, optimal two division problem. So you start with the domain D, and now you take uh, uh, an n tuple of subset of D, say two, which does not, they, they have to be disjoint, but does not need to be a partition in D. So the union shouldn't be the wall of D. And among all Coupled say of uh, of subsets, you try to minimize this functional, which is the the first eigenvalue, the first uh, Dirichlet eigenvalue of the subset, so the sum of the first Dirichlet eigenvalue of the subset plus some constant times the measure of this set. So this is uh, uh, this is a problem uh, which arises somehow in several applications, somehow, and has been studied by by several people. And somehow the, the, the idea is that this type of problem, for instance, they arises once you consider limits of uh, some sort of competing species problem. Okay? So somehow this region, so if you have two species, uh, and this region might be the, 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 the region where the species tends to cluster. So if you remove this, this constraint, this constraint, this penalization on the measure, then you would actually end up in a partition. This is a problem which has been studied a lot by Caffarelli and Lin and by Dufour, uh, Pragala, several authors. But, uh, and that's a bit more difficult than what I'm sorry, presenting here, um, and several questions are still open, but say, <clears throat> let, let's stick to this. So maybe the, the, you don't want to, so the, the, the species that some and the, the location of resources of the species is somehow constrained, so you would end up in a problem like this. And this is just to remind you that the, the, the definition of the Dirichlet eigenvalue, first Dirichlet eigenvalue, which is just the minimum of the relay quotient. Okay, so that's the problem. And now the question is how minimize that do look like? And what is funny is that you can run numerical simulations, for instance. And you would end up seeing features like this. So these are um, not fine features. Um, so this, these are just uh, this is uh, the dissimulation. I think is done on a torch, so it's sort of periodic thing. And you see that these domains. So first of all, you see that they don't want to be a partition in this. So there are some empty space. Then what you see again is that it seems that they only want to touch two by two. So there are no Tripolar or higher multiplicity point, and that's due to the presence of this constraint, actually. So in the actual situation in which you don't put this constant, or if you want to put this constant to zero, you're going to see some uh, some tripolar point. Um, and, uh, and indeed, you can, you can prove this. 
properties, so there are that you, there are no triple points. But what you also can prove quite easily is that if you take two domains and you look to their eigenfunction, uh, then and then you look to the difference. Well, then the difference is the local minimizer basically of the Bernoulli type two phase problem. So plus some higher order terms which are not really relevant for the analysis. And that's because somehow the Dirichlet uh, to the, the really quotient is the Dirichlet energy essentially. Okay, that's once you normalize things properly and uh, the L2 norm is sort of negligible. In particular because we are interested somehow to the zero set, so that the L2 norm is really negligible. Um, so you end up with somehow the minimizer of this type of problem. And let me stress that, and I will stress this even more later, that you see that you have some constants on the um, positive and negative part, but the constant on the zero part is zero. Okay? And that you see all the three phases. So there are points. So imagine that you just concentrate on these two domains. So somehow you can neglect this brownish one. But like here, you're going to see both the parts. So B would be positive in one domain, negative in the other, and zero in the white part. And you have these points where you see all the three phases together. Okay? And these are the points that I'm going to be into later on. And, that, and indeed, so what I was saying is that we are uh, interested in the regularity of the free boundary. So what should be the free boundary for our problem is the union of the somehow positive free boundary and negative free boundary, where the positive free boundary is nothing but the boundary of where u is positive, and the negative free boundary is the boundary where u is negative. And, and then I'm taking the union. And this is somehow the picture you expect to see, at least according to my simulation, not mine, to the simulation. So in particular, you sort of expect these two, uh, I mean, these two pre boundary positive and negative, to be somehow smooth or reasonably smooth, T1, and to touch tangentially when they do. Okay, that, that's what you would expect. It. So what can be said? Well, so what was known is the following. So first of all, I'm saying I'm interested in the pre boundary, but to understand the free boundary, you need to understand first that the, usually that's a well-established path in the work of Caffarelli. You need to understand the optimal regularity of your function somehow. And the optimal regularity turns out to be Lipschitz regularity. Okay, so besides the fact that it's Lipschitz and not T1, the fact that it should scale like Lipschitz is clear if you look to this functional, then because you have a Dirichlet energy term plus a measure term. So something which scales like a measure. And now you see these things scale like a length to the power d, and these things scale like u, uh, u square, yeah, u square times the length to the power t minus 2. And if you want these two things to scale the same, you need that you, you see that you should have the, the unit of a length, of uh, one over a length. So it's a Lipschitz type regularity. Okay? So Lipschitz regularity is indeed the, the, the optimal one, and it has been proved by Alta Caffarelli and by Alta Caffarelli Friedman in the in the so for the two types of problems. So for the one phase is sort of easy, for the two phase it's much more complicated. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you also why. But anyhow, this is different. So now what's the regularity? Well, for the one phase problem, the story is pretty much complete. So basically, what, what we know is that the, the, the positive free boundary, which is the only thing you have there, is smooth, totally analytic, uh, outside a small, uh, small closed set of dimension at most d minus 5. To so say in dimension 3, you don't have any singularity, neither in dimension 4. And uh, the first possible singularity might appear in dimension 5. Actually, this is not known because but there are examples of singular minimizer in dimension 7. And this is due to Jerison and De Silva, where they show the, the existence of a singular minimizer in dimension 7. And what is open, basically, is the only one, at least one of the most important open problems for one phase is to fill this gap. So either to improve this d minus 5 to d minus 7, or to show the example in dimension 5 and 6. Okay? So just to mention this is so this statement I made here is a 
combination of various results. So the first one are due to Alton Caffarelli. This somehow what is called an external regularity theorem, which will come later on again. And then there has been um, about this. So somehow the study of this dimension is due to the work of Weiss and then of Jenison and Sabin. Following what is the classical path, say in dramatic major theory, I might comment on this report later. Um, and, and so you get this d minus 5. But I want to stress that there has been a new recent proof, at least of this Alka Pareli part, which is somehow the key problem. So maybe for those who know the regularity theory of minimal surface, the Alka Pareli part for this problem is the same as the, the George Epsilon regularity theory for minimal surface. And there has been a new proof of this due to Daniela, some, I think now it's 10 years ago, uh, Daniela De Silva, and this new proof has been very important for us, so that's why I wanted to stress. So, though it's not, I mean, okay, it, it was working in a slightly, I mean, slightly more general setting of the one of Al Caffarelli, but was very important to us with the new idea introduced, basically, in the Actually, not the generalization, but really the, the new idea. Okay, so that's for the one phase. As for the two phase, well, what is known is that if lambda zero, so the penalization term of the on the zero phase, is larger or equal than the minimum between lambda plus and lambda minus, then what happens is that you don't have a zero phase in this. So the positive and negative free boundary they do coincide. And this is smooth. So they, they are both smooth and, and the three boundaries is just either of them is smooth. Okay. And this was due to Al Caprelli and Friedman and uh, somehow and to the work of Caprelli in the eighties for because the solution of uh, two phase problems. And again there has been a new proof of this result uh, following the idea of this paper of the, of Daniela of the Silva Ferrari and Salta and again these two proofs of the, is much influential on our work. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe let me go on this comment here. So why is this this situation more easy? Or well, easy maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's not easy, but it's understood. Uh, so assume that you are in this setting where the penalization on the zero term is larger or equal than the minimum between the lambda plus and lambda minus. And for the sake of clarity, let's assume that lambda minus is less or equal than lambda zero. Okay. Well, now basically, what I want to show is that there is no reason for the minimizer to have a zero part. And what we do for that, well, we take the region where the minimizer is say less or equal than zero. So we see this domain here inside this uh, black line here, and here we solve. The problem, so Laplacian V equals zero and V equal, um, yes, with my notation, U minus on the boundary. So you take the harmonic function, which has, um, uh, just the same boundary value of the negative part on this domain and it's uh, harmonic. Okay. So the function is, uh, uh, so for me, the, the negative part is positive in this, at least for this goal. So don't like the capacity uh, convention, so I keep it. So, so this function v would be strictly positive inside. Okay, and now I take a new competitor, which is u plus, so the old positive part of my measure minus v. So basically, I'm replacing my old function where it was zero or negative with now its harmonic replacement on that. Thing. And what I claim is that he has like this w as less energy. So that W would be something like this. So, and why it has less energy? Well, obviously it has less Dirichlet energy because on the positive side you still, so these two are the joint support. On the positive side, it's the same. And on the negative side, you have put the harmonic function. And actually you have strictly less energy unless your function was somehow already non-negative and harmonic. Uh, the negative part was uh, strictly positive, sorry, and harmonic because because of the maximum ring, right? So so here you're uh, getting some uh, some gain, 
And also in the measure term, you're getting some gain, but that's just trivial algebra because this, the, the measure of this guy is just the sum of these two. And the coefficients are done in a way that this is larger than this. So that's nothing big in here. So you see that there is really no reason for a minimizer to have a zero part. So that's why the two uh, free boundaries coincide. And now once the two free boundaries coincide, you can apply somehow the theory of Caffarelli for two phase free boundary, which was developed in this, um, in this context and deduce regularity of the free boundary. Okay. But again, if you think to my, penal, to my starting problem, this constraint here is completely uh, uh, unreasonable. For me, lambda zero was zero. So I really need to understand what would be the situation in, lambda, in which lambda zero is less than the minimum, say zero, for instance. Uh, you can use the reduce to the setting in this, uh, in this situation. And there, as I was saying, you expect to see the three pages concurring together around some point. And that is really where you want to, to, to do the analysis somehow. And these points are what uh, I would call branch points. I'm gonna call branch points in this sequence. And it's where you really need to, to do something new because you see here locally, you would expect to be a minimizer for the one phase problem. So somehow things are understood. Here you would expect to be a minimizer of the Two phase problem without zero, uh, without zero part where you can apply Caffarelli theory. So basically, what you need to understand is what is happening here. Okay, and well, these and how to somehow pull uh, pull um, all together, right? Because you have a regularity theory here, a regularity theory here. Say so you be able to get some regularity theory here, but then you need the, the, the three regularity theory to pass from one to the other smooth. Okay, come out. Okay, so what's what we the theorem we proved is that uh, that the picture is sort of correct in this. So again, so you take a local minimizer of our functional, let's define again the positive and negative free boundary. Then you define what is called the double phase free boundary, which is just the intersection of the positive and negative free boundary. So it could be this part here, or maybe this branch point. So it's it's the thing where who, whose relative boundary should be the branch point, the relative boundary inside the gamma. And then you call the one phase positive and negative free boundary to be the complement, okay? And the positive and negative part of the free boundary. So, um, so what, we, what we prove is that the positive and negative free boundary are indeed uh, smooth, actually C1 graph, and okay, I'm gonna, so let me say this. Uh, you cannot really improve C1 alpha. I mean, you can improve a bit the alpha with respect to what we did, but uh, you cannot get above uh, C1, one alpha, the reason I'm gonna explain. So for now on, smooth would mean C1 something, okay? So it's not actually smooth. It, you cannot really, I mean, you can build that example. So uh, you cannot really go above C1 something, but stay smooth for, for the sake of the talk. So, so these are two actually two smooth graphs, which would touch on this set, possibly, except on a small set of dimension d minus five. But what we can tell you is that this set is actually just due to the one phase free boundary. So you know that in the one phase theory, you can have a regular, uh, you can have a small singular set. Well, then you might, Still have in this theory, but this this singular set is not getting close to the two phase free boundary. Okay, so the intersection is empty, and since these are two closed sets, they are at positive distance apart. Okay, so so yeah, you can have a singular set, but this can just lie on the one phase free boundary because of the phenomenon already understood somehow. While around the the, the branch points, you're just gonna see to uh, smooth graph touch. So let me stress that this is, I mean, I like the theorem, but um, there is still something which is not understood, which is the actual structure of this two phase. So for, for what we are saying, this two phase can be sort of any closed subset of a C1 alpha graph, okay? 
So we don't have any structure here. So in particular, we don't know much on the dimension of, uh, of the branch points. So for instance, in the, in the two-dimensional situation, I would expect branch points to be isolated, but for what we know, they can be basically any closed subset of the, of the real line. Okay? So no, no estimation dimension or whatever. Uh, okay, so that's the theorem. And uh, so how do we prove this theorem? Well, uh, it goes somehow along the classical uh, steps. I mean, okay, let's see, one tries to apply the classical uh, steps in geometric measure theory and geometric analysis, which is to perform first a blow-up analysis and then to understand what is called an epsilon regularity theorem. Okay? So these are uh, somehow this is a general uh, approach to this type of problem, which has been uh, introduced. I mean, the breakthrough was due to the Georgi and, and the last, I would say, 60, 60 years. This has been a classical path. So, but before doing that, let's maybe discuss a bit what are the optimality conditions you would expect on a problem, right? You have the variational problem, the first thing you want, as you I usually try to do, is to write down optimality conditions, which are easier to understand. Okay, the first trivial one is just that the function wants to be harmonic where it's non-zero. Okay, where it's non-zero is an open set. If you make more modification there, there is no reason. You, you're not going to change positive negative sets, so just, the function just wants to be harmonic. Fine. But this is a very weak information because it's telling you nothing on the pre-boundary. So to understand something on the pre-boundary, what you need to do is to move it, right? And the way to move it is according to this inner variation. So basically, you find the infinitesimal flow diffeomorphism of the domain, and you precompose your function with this diffeomorphism, and then you impose that the energy is stationary along this flow of the of diffeomorphism. Okay, so this is going to give you some uh, in this uh, optimality condition, but you're going to miss some of them, which are important in the analysis. So let me give you a different way to to, to to the use optimality condition, which is, uh, I'll focus on the one dimensional setting. I'll show you why it's not even so restrictive. So, okay, so let's assume we start from the one dimensional setting. So our function is harmonic, but it's non zero, so meaning it's just sequence linear. And we want to understand what this, I mean, if we can say something about this alpha and beta here, right? So let's make this deformation. So let's take the, this point and move it a bit on the right. So now you have this function. Just let me stress that this uh, deformation cannot be obtained by precomposing by a di the function with the diffeomorphism of the interval, right? I really broke the function. And in particular, I need that sign to be positive. I cannot do this deformation for negative epsilon. The function won't be a function anymore, right? Okay, so this would be my new competitor, and now I compute the energy, I tell her expand, and what I get is that this quantity has to be positive. And now I divide by epsilon, and epsilon to zero, and since epsilon can be just positive, I found this inequality here, that the, the, the slope of the positive part somehow should be larger or equal than lambda plus minus lambda zero. The, the slope squared. But this is an optimality condition which comes in form of an inequality. Okay? And then there is another one which is more related to what I was saying of moving in the domain, which comes by just moving all together. Okay? So both positive and negative. So note that this time I can get that to be both positive and negative. And now again, I tell it expands. And what I get, now I send epsilon to zero, I can send it the yeah, positive or negative value, so I get an equality. And here I get the transmission type condition. So the, the, the difference in slope, in the square of the slope actually, be equal to lambda plus minus lambda minus. And note that I could have done the same analysis even if I am in a one phase point. And in this case, I would get that the slope square should be should have been equal to lambda plus minus lambda two. Okay. Okay, so all in all, the type of uh, optimality condition I would expect to see is to be harmonic. Where u is non-zero, 
to satisfy this uh, sort of transmission condition. So, well, actually, this is more like a Neumann type condition on the boundary of the positive phase. Then to have a transmission condition on the somehow interior of my two phase three boundary and the global inequality. Okay? So, you see, you are combining some sort of both Neumann and Dirichlet problem and same here, though it's a transmission condition along a zero set. And now you see the problem is rigid. That's why you expect the regularity for the three boundary, right? I mean, you, you're somehow imposing both the Dirichlet and the uh, Neumann condition on the free boundary. And we know that this cannot be done arbitrarily, right? So if you want to solve an equation imposing both Dirichlet and Neumann, you would expect your solution. I mean, you can do this, but you need the boundary to be analytic, basically. So in a sense, the world regularity theory for three boundaries is a sort of convert of cauchy covalente That's the way to think of it. So the fact that on that three boundary, I can assign both a Dirichlet and uh, um, a Dirichlet and a Neumann problem means that the three boundary cannot be that generic, right? So there should be some, some regularity in that. That's somehow how you might want to think about uh, three boundary problems. And then I have this inequality, which is important. Uh, let, let me stress that this inequality really comes from the variational problem. While these are sort of stationarity points, stationarity condition, this one is more like uh, it's more related on the fact that you have a variational problem. Okay, and that may be something which put some confusion in, in in the understanding that. This is, this is really an information which comes from being minimizer, where this is like the definition of being stationary. I mean, obviously, when, once you have an actual minimizer of a problem, you can perform several variations on that minimizer, right? We usually look just to Euler-Lagrange equations or some variation of Euler-Lagrange equations, but actually, I mean, obviously, a minimizer should have more properties than just a stationary point because you have a lot of deformation, even infinitesimal ones, microscopic, microscopic ones. And this is something which has been hidden. So if you just think of the stationary condition, you would probably miss this type of condition, which is indeed of key importance. Okay. So these are the optimality condition. Okay. So now we can perform the blow up analysis. And uh, so maybe I'll be quick on that. So what does it mean to perform blow up analysis? It means that we take a point on the free boundary and we try sort of zoom around the point. And this can be done by just considering this family of scaling. It's easy to see that this family of uh, function is still a solution for the scale the boundary. And this time, so if my original function was defined in brx0, this one would be defined in b 1 Okay. And what we can prove is that this function, well, that comes from Lipschitz regularity. So these functions are pre-compact in C0. And any of that limit points is going to be a one homogeneous function. And that's the key fact coming from Weiss monotonic sequence. So you, and this would somehow tell you what is the asymptotic behavior of your free boundary. Then. So what that says indeed, if you take, if your free boundary started to be regular, okay, so a regular car, say you take a point at zero and with a normal E of a zero. Well, then what you would expect is to see that your your the free boundary would blow up sort of in an plane, well in a in a line in this case, and positive and negative parts should become a positive and negative half phase. And uh, and according to the optimality condition I gave you before, so say the one dimensional computation, you would expect to see your function to be uh, a somehow piecewise linear. So if you were blowing up in a one phase part point, you would expect to see this. While if you were blowing up in a two-phase point, you would expect to see something like this, where the slopes, um, where the slopes are related by this uh, transmission condition, and you still have in a phase. Okay, so that's what you would expect to see around the one-phase point. And now, uh, and now you do uh, sorry, not around the one-phase point, around the regular points. So now you do the opposite. Okay, you do the opposite means that you call regular. A point for which you see a blow up like that. Okay? 
So this is a very bad definition, right? Because in principle, you see one blow up, you don't, you have no idea. So there is no uniqueness of blow up here yet. So you might have other blow ups along other subsequences look different. This plane, this, even if they all look the same, we don't know if this vector, this normal vector is not, uh, sort of rotating. So anyhow, this is my definition of regular point, which is pretty easy. But with this definition, at least what you can uh, prove is that somehow the complement of regular points, according to this definition, is somehow small. That's somehow the, the, that classical thing. It's, uh, it's a feather is the dimension reduction argument. And comes by combining uh, this mono device monotonicity formula with some by now classical techniques in general. So these are my singular sets. Okay, but now I have to show that regular sets are really regular so that I see my free boundary behaving around there. How do I expect? So basically, this is where the epsilon regularity theorem comes. Because, uh, um, okay. <laughs> so this is where epsilon regularity theorem comes because you basically have uh, at some scale you're going to be close to some good configuration. And you want to say something like, once I'm close enough to a good configuration, then I will be close to that configuration or to the small perturbation of that configuration all the way to zero. Okay? That's sort of the idea of an epsilon regularity. So you pass from an infinitesimal information on a sequence of scale to a macroscopic information on a big scale. That's how it works. So epsilon regularity theory was indeed understood in one phase point. That was but I was mentioning the work of Cal Caparelli and this new proof of Daniela, and at the interior of two phase points, so where you don't see the zero part, the zero set. And this again was Caparella and um, the Stephen Ferrari part. Okay? So now what you want to understand is what happens at branch points. And then, as I was saying, you want to need, you need to put all the regularity theory all together, which I won't discuss, but it's not easy. Okay, so let me tell you how this proof works at one phase point. So actually, this is uh, Daniela's proof. And then, because how much time do I have? I think I'm five minutes, maybe? No? Yeah, considering that you have started a bit late because of the issues, I mean, you have a few minutes more, don't worry. Okay, um, so what I'm saying is that. Um, so let, let me give you a proof of a, a sketch of the proof of Daniela, uh, of Daniela's proof, and then I'll tell you what the difficult to So um, so assume that we are at one phase point and let me normalize things in this way. So okay, lambda minus lambda zero is zero and lambda plus is one. Okay. So you would expect your function u to be something like uh, close to a say broken out plane, something like this. Well, then you write q as this limiting thing plus some perturbation. And the perturbation is defined in such a way that it has an infinite norm over the one. And now you try to understand what is, what are somehow the equations for this perturbation. Well, first of all, this perturbation, not that I'm not uh, perturbing with this, but with x1, and so I'm getting something which is more. Where, well, where u is harmonic, so on the set where u is positive, which somehow, because of this, should be a positive alpha ball. Right? Should be a perturbation, in some yet horrible sense, of a positive alpha ball. Okay, so that's the first condition. Second condition comes from this Neumann condition here, uh, which if I expand, is basically telling me that my V epsilon is solving a Neumann problem almost up to a small error, little of one, on the boundary of the positive part, which should be like the boundary of my alpha ball. So in other words, what I expect is that V epsilon to be very close to a solution of the Neumann problem on the alpha ball. And now if this very close is in the reasonable topology, I can use uh, the regularity theory for the Neumann problem to find a new alpha plane solution which is closer to my solution at say a smaller scale, say one alpha, than what the, the scale would just uh, 
I mean, better than ellipsis scaling. It's better than what the ellipsis scale in the good set. Okay? So something like uh, almost a C11, almost a C2 scale, right? One row would go away in the C2 scale and then it gets another row to the one minus sum. So almost a row, which is, uh, which is basically a C1 decay. C2 and C2. Okay. So you were close to a configuration like this, then up to tilting a bit this this vector, you you are much closer to again another configuration like this. Which you think you, you really need to tilt the vector, let me stress, because I mean it, that's a typical feature of epsilon regularity theorem, right? Because even if you start with an half plane solution with a slightly with a vector which is not really one, you're gonna be close. To, to the alpha plane solution whose vector is the uh, one, right? So you need, in your proof, you need to recognize that you are changing your direction. Otherwise, there is no hope to get a decay, right? So, so that's important, that, that you are able to, to take this vector. Okay, so that's how the, the one regularity of one-phase problem would go. So what about the two-phase problem? And that would be very good. So again, imagine so renormalized constant in this way. So lambda plus minus lambda plus minus r equals one, lambda zero is zero. So you would actually be close to a linear function. Though let me stress that it might be something like this. Eh? It might close, be close to the linear function, but not be a smooth perturbation. That's, that's um, okay, and again I play the same role to add some to write this perturbation from the linear function to be v plus and v minus. So basically, these are again are the perturbation here and here. So I, I really need so this function is defined where u is positive and this is where u is negative. I really need sort of to distinguish this uh, uh, between the two parts because I, I somehow need to, to recognize this, this, this continuity. Okay. And now, what would be the equation satisfied by the v plus and v minus? Well, in a sense, we are going to go to satisfy a thin obstacle, thin obstacle type problem. I would actually call this the two thin to membrane problem, but that's essentially a variation of the thin obstacle problem. And so why that? So what, what, how do we, how shall we think this uh, D plus and D minus? Well, asymptotically, at least, uh, the trace of D plus and D minus on the half, so let me, okay, let me put the E1 direction. Upward. So imagine that you have your uh, function and it's, it's the free boundary, and say here u is zero. But this is the point where x1 plus epsilon b plus is zero. So in a sense, you expect that the, the, the graph, so the free boundary, to be sort of a graph of the trace of b plus on x1 equals zero, somehow, of minus. So that's what should, so this, this intuition is actually formalized. You see here, that what are one phase points are points where v plus, asymptotically, they should become points where v plus and v minus do not coincide, they, their traces do not coincide, right? Because it's like asymptotically what is happening here, but the two functions are, uh, are separated. After one year, I So let's say here you is positive and we are going to do negative. This is my old color. So so now what you would expect again, so here it's where u plus, so this is the one phase free boundary, so you either, and here you expect to see a Neumann condition as in the one phase point. On the other end, where the two traces coincide, this should be like uh, the two phase free boundary. So here you, you have a transmission condition with translating a transmission condition for my solution. And here, uh, this global inequality translates in a global inequality. So actually, this is, these are the only Lagrange equation, the product which has uh, come from calculus operation, 
these are the other Lagrange like, equation of a problem in which you minimize your two functions, one defined on the positive, let's say, in the positive half ball, half ball, the other one defined on the negative half ball, and you are minimizing the Dirichlet energy of, of, of both functions to so the sum with the constraint that one is on top of the other on the, um, on the half plane. That these are the these are the Euler Lagrange equation of this problem. And the fact that you are imposing this, this constraint comes from the fact that there is a natural order between positive and negative sides of the function. Okay, so you can have the negative side to the inside the, the positive side. Okay, so so this is uh, it, it's uh, it's immediate somehow to, to translate this problem into a uh, into a thin obstacle problem, which is some reflection breaking. So it enjoys the same regularity of the one phase problem, uh, of the thin, uh, sorry, of the thin obstacle problem, for which the optimal regularity is C11 out. And now you can pull back this regularity to your original problem and deduce some C1 regularity. Okay? And then you lose a bit in the alpha in trying to match up all the, all the, all the different theories, but that's because we were lazy and not good enough. I think you can get up to this. To be done perfectly. Uh, so maybe the last comment is that the key point in all these proofs is how these things, so how my approximate things, becomes close to um, the limiting problem. And maybe let me stress that this is one of the most important parts in a channel regularity theory. It might look to be technical. But this is exactly where epsilon regularity theory might fail is 90% of the time because of this. So in a lot of problems where you do not have an epsilon regularity theory, the sort of formal linearization of the problem works. I mean, it's just a formal computation. The point is that you don't have compactness to get to the linearized equation and to pull back your regularity theory from the linearized equation to your original equation. And this is not just a technical issue. I mean, there are situations in which regularity theory fails, but still you have a linearization, linearization, formal linearization. One example, again, for those which are in calculus of variation, is the theory of the regularity theory for quasi-convex functions. So for quasi-convex functional, for minimizer, you have an epsilon regularity theory. For just solution of the Euler Lagrange equation, you don't have. And there are examples of solutions which are everywhere. Uh, with gradient is everywhere this Okay, so it's not, and, but the linearized equation are the same. So it's not it's a problem how you go to linearity. And same for those which are maybe in uh, harmonic in uh, geometric analysis, a bit more same happens for the stationary method. Stationary harmonic. Okay, so it's it's not just a technical thing. You see what what the big is come up. So, and what, why this is a problem? Because these are bounded in C0. And somehow you want a C0 convergence to, to play the game I was, uh, I was telling you before. So you need convergence in the same topology where you are bounded. That's the typical feature of a regularity. Either you want these or you want some sort of catch up with that. But anyhow, you need to improve on convergence. Okay, that's the meta theorem. And this has to be a nonlinear thing. You cannot rely on the solution of the linear problem. You really need to understand some, some nonlinear uh, compactness before. And this was done by Daniela, adapting but an idea of Ovidio Savin, which is this partial Arnak inequality. And that's what we needed to do in this situation. And, uh, okay, the, the function also defined on changing domain. So this is the not the point. Uh, and what is the difficulty of the compactness and what where branch points fits in is that again compactness should be done somehow at scale one. Okay. And so though you you want to analyze the point where the three phases concur, you might at scale one you might not be able to recognize that point. Okay. So it might be that you believe to be close to a configuration like a half, like a, like this one, but actually you are much closer to a configuration like this, which is still a minimizer. 
And you see that there is a sort of discontinuity from one configuration to the other, right? So they are not a smooth deformation one to the other. So, uh, but this is might very well happen because it's exactly what is happening in a point like this. So since well, that's another feature of epsilon regularity theory that since you try to say something that's scale one, if you move, I mean, you cannot have any meaningful information on what's happening with zero because right, zero with respect to one is too small. So if, if you are a bit uncareful and your ball was centered not at the right point, but just tiny on the right, at some point you need to see this going down on the scale. And that's exactly what is happening here is where the difficulty is. Okay? But, okay, so that's what I wanted to say. So this is where you actually need to work. And I think that's all. Thank you.